Good morning, all media houses present here this morning. Um, we just want to say thank you for gracing this invitation to Citizens Alliance to speak with people. Um, this morning, it's going to be a very, very simple and direct event. We've called you here because we think we, uh, there's a need for us to engage the media and put out a plan to talk to you guys to lay out that plan, that roadmap to you after we can have an interaction where we will allow you to ask questions. Um, it wouldn't be long, so thank you very much. And uh, Doctor? Uh, thank you very much, Nene. Thank you for sharing this occasion. Um, So yeah, thank you very much for chairing the occasion. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, all Media House is present today here. I welcome you all to this very important press conference. It is going to be our press, first press conference since we um, uh, had the Congress uh, two weeks ago. And also since we launched our manifesto um, last weekend. The idea is going forward we would be consistently engaging the media through press conferences. So we'll be having periodic press conferences, um, perhaps monthly or perhaps quarterly. But the idea is that every month or every six weeks or frequently, we will talk to the media to tell us what we think about the direction of the country and also our positions on certain key national issues. Um, as you would recall, um, we had our Congress, National Congress, as required by the Constitution, by the electoral laws, and by the IEC regulations two weeks ago. To be more precise, it was on the 28th of um, November we had our Congress. At the same time, we also had a rally in Bikama that evening. The Congress was very successful. Um, we had the opportunity to establish uh, the first ever National Executive Council of the Citizens Alliance. The process obviously was very transparent and participatory. Um, the rally also was successful as well. We were happy that um, it was a very successful event. A week later, we also launched the Citizens Alliance Manifesto called the Contract with the Gambian People, where we laid out our agenda for the country when we come to power. And this agenda hinged on four pillars. The first pillar was had to do with um, economic prosperity and decent jobs. Um, in that pillar, we outlined our vision for how the country should look like when it comes to our economy and also to providing the decent jobs for Gambians, especially the young people. Um, so what we did there was to come up with the ideas how do we build a strong economy? How do we move away from how do we move away from the dependency syndrome we've been having since independence? How do we harness our local resources to generate wealth and invest that wealth uh, in, on the Gambian people? Um, we looked at key sectors, key strategic sectors like agriculture, tourism, um, the marine sector, obviously, and the human uh, capital as well. So we did that, and then we also, the second pillar had to do with um, empowering the Gambian citizenry. What we tried to say there was that if we harness our resources to generate the world, that will must be invested in the Gambian people um, to ensure that every Gambian lives a dignified life, to ensure that every Gambian, no matter where you are born in this country, no matter from which socioeconomic background, 
you have access to the most basics that can allow you to live a dignified life access to quality relevant education access to quality health care access to clean water access to uninterrupted electricity and so on and so forth so we also discussed that one and the third pillar was to ensure uh, governance strong institutions because if you generate the wealth uh, the only way you can guarantee that wealth is equitably distributed in society with the principles of solidarity and fairness is you must create the right institutions otherwise what will happen is that a few will benefit from this world and the rest will not benefit and that is not the idea the idea is that every gambian must benefit from gambia's wealth and gambia's resources so we also talked about how to build strong institutions how to ensure that we fight corruption and impunity in this country which has been our problem since independence and the fourth pillar has to do with ensuring peace and stability i mean if you generate wealth um, even if you invest that wealth in people by building the strong institutions if there is no peace and stability then the whole exercise will be um, not useful. So these are the four pillars of our manifesto. We hope that the media have already read the manifesto, or we hope you will read it to engage us in this manifesto. Like we said, the manifesto uh, is a framework for what we think the country should take in terms of direction. It is still under review, obviously. We know it will subject it to critique. And we hope that one of the key stakeholders that will critique the manifesto will be the media to, to tell us, look, you are saying X, Y, Z here, but how is this possible? Uh, what are the alternatives to this? Perhaps the alternatives are better. And this will create a kind of a debate. And this debate will help us improve on the manifesto as we go on. And I've argued uh, during the launch of the manifesto that the world is in a state of flux. The world is changing on a daily basis. The dynamics are changing on a daily basis. Global dynamics are changing. Economic trends are changing. Uh, industrial trends are changing. Social trends are changing. Political trends are changing. So by the time we are done with this manifesto, to before even elections, some of the things might have changed. Some of the data that we use to generate the manifesto might have changed drastically. How do you go back and review and also make sure that the manifesto is in line with these trends? So the manifesto, obviously, is subject to review and critique, especially from the media. We want to generate a debate on how the country should be governed. Uh, quite so often, we focus on who should govern this country rather than how should this country be governed. And once we don't focus on the how and on the who, then there's a problem in this country. And I think the idea is to move away from the who should govern and to focus more on how should we govern this country? How do we solve all our complex problems in this country? How do we solve the crime rate in this country, the youth unemployment in this country, the irregular migration problem in this country, the lack of energy, the lack of water, uh, the lack of proper medical health care in this country, the lack of proper education for our kids in this country, the lack of a proper dignified life for our old age pensioners in this country. How do we solve all these problems? Our environmental problems, our demographic problems, obviously. Um, today, the statistics are telling us that we are 2.4 million people. But again, that is not the issue. The issue is that it's projected that by 2050 will be 5 million people. How do we build a country for 5 million people? That, you don't do that in 2050, you start that now. So these are all problems that we have to be focusing on, but it seems like we are focusing less on these problems and the, I, the whole debate revolves around who should govern. And we think that we should uh, be also mindful of focusing on how do we really govern the country. Now, with all said and done, we, uh, since we launched the party one year ago, Citizens Alliance has done quite tremendously. Um, within one year, if you look at all the achievements and all the engagements and all the policy solutions we've preferred to government, the manner in which we helped in the fight against COVID-19 as well, through sensitization, uh, by distribution of masks, uh, distribution of hygiene products, and so on and so forth, um, to our Congress, to our manifesto. So I think we've done quite well. Uh, we thank the entire Citizens Alliance membership and those who were running the party during this period for a job well done. Now, moving forward, we all know that we are entering election year. 2021, December 4th, Gambians will go to the polls to elect the next president of this country. Now, Gambians must understand that this is going to be the first elections post-dictatorship. 
it is going to be held within a very fragile context. The reforms that were supposed to take place have all but failed so far. The idea was that the new coalition government was supposed to create the foundations for reforms, obviously. The security sector reform, the civil service reform, the constitutional reform, and so on and so forth. But also to provide the framework for reconciliation within the Gambian, among the Gambian people. And um, the idea was that the whole process of moving from autocracy to democracy was supposed to be a long process towards consolidation of our democracy. And we all are aware that the coalition came with an agenda that was very attractive, not only to Gambians, but also to the international community. That is why when the former president refused to cede power after losing the elections, there was a lot of engagement, especially from the international community, because they believed that was the agenda that could move the Gambia from dictatorship to democracy. And the coalition government made a lot of promises on their agenda that we thought, if implemented, would move us away uh, from dictatorship to democracy. But we've seen how this whole agenda was aborted from the onset. Now, moving to 2021, in 2016, Gambians voted for democracy and the rule of law. The idea was that we are going to build a country that was based on democracy. We are going to change the legal framework to ensure that there will be free and fair elections and transparent elections in this country going forward. However, what we've seen is that we've seen no change since 2016. The legal reforms, the constitution that was drafted and taken to parliament was thrown out. It did not even reach to the second reading because of the selfish interest of a few people against the national wish, obviously. The TRRC is ongoing, obviously. We don't know how the process will end. And for me, it will be a great betrayal of the Gambian people. Or for us at the Citizens Alliance, it will be a great, a great betrayal of the Gambian people if we are to go into next elections with the current legal framework. Then what was the basis for the change then? What was the basis? Why did we change? The idea was that we won't change. But it seems like the way things are going is business as usual. And when you want credible, free, fair elections with the integrity that it deserves, within that will really provide stability in this country. You must plan these elections properly ahead. All these stakeholders, the political stakeholders, civil society, the media must be in sync. We all must agree to the rules of the game. But currently, there is no consensus. And this government is planning to cheat these elections on a massive scale. And that stealing has started. And we have concerns about that. One of the concerns is what? We've seen how the incumbent is using GRTS airtime to pursue his political agenda. I mean, how can you have NPP meetings shown on GRTS? GRTS is a public institution that is supposed to give equal access to all political parties in this country. But we are seeing that GRTS shows events even to the extent that an event I was watching the last time was about NPP office electing their executive, it's shown on GRTS. For us, that is unfair. And that must stop now if you want to have a free, fair process during the elections. The second issue has to do with the tour. The tour, yes, it is constitutional mandated, but it's two weeks. But now it's been extended to 30 days using taxpayers' money, using state resources. And everything you see in this talk is not about the country, it's about NPP. People cross capping from one party to the other. That should not be an agenda on the tour. NPP flags being raised and so on, that should not be an agenda. IEC should not allow that. The cheating starts now. And I think the Gambian people and the international community must pay attention to these things. If elections go wrong, this is where it starts. This is where it starts. So we condemn the act that the current president is doing, especially with regards to the tour, spending billion, millions of taxpayers' money to go on a tour to promote a particular political party's agenda. The other issue, which we think also is worthy of mentioning, and which we think the IEC and the government should take note, 
is the tenor of the IAC chairman. This is very crucial. We are not saying that his tenor is has ex, he doesn't have the mandate. But once there are suggestions from all corners that his tenor had ended, there must be transparency around the tenor of the IAC chairperson. You see, when you go to play a football game and the qualification or the legitimacy of the referee is in doubt, it must be solved before the game starts. Because once the game ended, it could derail the whole entire process. Because if, if, for example, after elections, a particular party wins, and a particular stakeholder takes the case to court that, the, in fact, the IAT chairman was not qualified to oversee these elections, and it came that that is the case, the entire process derailed. So the IAC must come out and tell us exactly what the issues surrounding the tenure of the IEC chairperson. We cannot go to elections with that being shrouded in mystery. We need to know. We don't, there must be transparency around the tenure of the IEC chairperson. If, for, if there is the case that he is, his tenure is intact, that he is supposed to be, no, no, we don't have any problems with that. But we need to know, as stakeholders, the issues surrounding the tenure of the IEC chairperson. Now, we've all seen what happened with the draft constitution. We did consultations across the country and in the diaspora. Around $16 million was spent for this constitution. It was supposed to go through a process, and the government people were supposed to be the ultimate decider for whether we have to have a new constitution or not. The whole entire process was aborted at a very early stage, without even giving the chance for lawmakers to debate over the content of the draft constitution. And now the government has the audacity to tell us that they are going to engage an international organization called IDEA to lead the process and to add salt to injury, they are bringing someone from outside they call an eminent person to lead the process. We have enough eminent Gambians who can lead this process. We have enough eminent Gambians who can lead this process. We cannot allow a situation whereby, in fact, this government has no legitimacy whatsoever to deal with this draft anymore. They killed it. You kill something deliberately in surgery, and now you want to come and revive it. Just to waste our time, just to show the international community they are doing something about it. You see, we cannot have deception anymore in this country. We cannot. So for us, the government has no legitimacy anymore to deal with this draft. What the government should do now is to ensure and I want Gambian people to listen and the international community that the right legal frameworks are in place before 2021. It will not make any sense. It will defeat the purpose. It will be a great betrayal. If we are to go into 2021 without certain reforms taking place, and these reforms are what? We must see what we can do with the 97 constitution to amend it so we have time limit in the constitution before 2021. That is a, that we cannot, we should not compromise that. Term limit must be in the Constitution, even if it's in 97, because the draft is almost dead. They want to bring it now, waste our time. Before it is done, it is next year. By that time, the person who will wait 2021, this time will not count, even the next time will not even count. And we cannot allow that. So we must go back to the 97 Constitution and do the required amendments to ensure that term limit is in the Constitution before we go for the elections in 2021. The second issue reform that must be done has to do with the 50 plus one. Anybody who's supposed to govern this country must get the mandate of the government people at least over half. This gives you strong legitimacy to govern this country. So we must go back to the 97 constitution now and amend that section as well. We cannot go, I mean for me, for us, going to elections with the status quo, with what we inherited from 97, to be honest, it's a big betrayal. Not only of this generation, also for the next generation. So we must take note of these things and ensure that we do these necessary reforms before next elections. We cannot allow a situation whereby we go for elections with the same status quo, with no changes. With the way the incumbent is using state resources to do his campaigning. What has changed then from, 2020, from 2016? What is the basis for our change? So basically, that is why we call the media today to state serious position on these things. That for us to have a free, fair elections, 
with the integrity it deserves to ensure their stability both pre-election and post-election certain things must be in place we must have a proper road map a national road map where all stakeholders accept we cannot wait until the elections are over and we start crying foul it is not possible we have to bring the attention of the Gambian people and the government to these issues now that we cannot accept the status quo as it is so therefore electoral reforms are very crucial to secure a free fair and transparent elections because Gambia is at the crossroads and political actors need to work together to defend the national interest because this will support long-lasting reconciliation we voted for change in 2016 with the hope that a full review of the repressive laws of this country and the policies we inherited from the previous government to usher in a new democratic system a third republic which is anchored on the rule of law equality justice and national unity but that is not what is happening as we speak there's so much political polarization the opposition and the government are not looking each other in the eye they're not talking and this is dangerous, especially within this volatile, fragile context heading towards elections. Therefore, we are very concerned that we witness the derailment of the entire transition by key leaders of the coalition 2016, led by the president, Adam Abaro, who decided to pursue his own personal agenda at the detriment of the long-awaited reform on national unity. It is against this background that CA with other political actors, if necessary, we will engage independent people and political actors to see the need to work together to encourage the entire political class to demand for reforms of the electoral laws, especially reforms of the constitution, especially these two provisions. We must have time limit in the constitution before elections. And we must also have the 50 plus one before elections. Because going to elections without reforms will have huge implications for the peace and security of this country and the long-term stability of this country. So for the election to bring the real and meaningful changes, there must be one time limit agreed by political actors and introduced in the ongoing reforms. To the second round voting must be introduced to ensure clear majority that will enable the winner to govern with legitimacy. But most importantly also, we are calling strongly for the IAC to make sure they operationalize diaspora voting. The diaspora must vote. We cannot accept a situation whereby a huge chunk of our citizens are disenfranchised. The diaspora must vote. And I think IAC should start to get us a plan to tell us how, what they want to do for the diaspora to vote. So these are things that we, the Citizens Alliance, think we should discuss it with the media and the Gambian people. We want the Gambian people to take note because the international community is a st key stakeholder. We want them to start engaging the political class now. So there's consensus around the roadmap to 2021 election. So everybody is on the same page. Rather than wait until when things go wrong, they start jetting in and out of Banjul, trying to solve a problem which they could have solved way before. And I think this is very, very, very important. So basically on a final note, what we are saying is that the way things are going doesn't go well for the transition. If we want to have a, a proper elections, which is free, fair, and transparent, certain things must be sorted out now, especially the tenor of the IEC chairperson. It must be clear to every Gambian that he has the legitimacy to be there. There cannot be rumors around. There cannot be questions. There cannot be... His tenor should not be in mystery. Everybody should know that the referee is qualified to be there. We cannot go to a game whereby the referee's own legitimacy is under question. And the reforms are key. And I think we urge the government to ensure that they do the necessary thing to ensure that we do the necessary reform before 2021. I thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Ismail Assisi. Um, I think that was a very, very clear Thank you, Dr. Ismail Sisi, and that was a very, very clear um, message delivered out there.
um, Citizens Alliance believes that um, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. And get it, not only getting started, getting started at the right time, on a timely basis. And like Ismail Assisi said earlier on, we need to start holding this government to account. We need to start the uh, scrutinization right now. We don't have to wait until after the fact we start crying foul. It will be too late. And that's what we are trying to do here. So um, I want to welcome you once again and uh, question and um, questions are open if anybody has a question please raise your hand um, introduce yourself which media house you're coming from and you can ask your question then Ismail will be able to answer it okay we have um, the gentleman over there no, go ahead. Oh, okay, because he's behind. I didn't yeah, see. I didn't. I didn't see her. I didn't see. Her. Go ahead, my dear. Oh, really? Yes. No, no. You, you saw him. Before. It's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't buy that. I mean, anyway, but yeah. Um, Thank you so much. My name is Jason Taylor for um, Ghana for Online News. Um, commonly known as Black Star. Um, so my first question is about. Time limits. Um, you've said a lot about time limits. Um, the Gambian people have overwhelmingly said that they want time limits. But I look to your leadership. I haven't seen some of your other documents. But my question is about yourself, the party, and time limits. I know your position now on time limits for the country. Do you have time limits? Because you did talk a lot about having one. A lot of the political parties are individual, you could say, cult groups, almost. Uh, because they have one leader who is there for almost forever. Uh, why I'm asking, do you have time limits in Citizens Alliance to convince us that that is what you will bring into the country when you have um, the mandate of the government? Thank you. That's a very important question. Um, I'll even pay you $100 for asking that question. <laughs> um, yes, Citizens Alliance, since inception, what we discussed was that for a political party in this country to stay relevant in the next 50 to 100 years, you must create strong internal democratic systems because the citizens are not only demanding democracy from their state, from their government, but also from their political parties. And any political party who is not aware of this fact and doesn't adapt to the changing environment, you will stay out of relevance. What we did agree on from the onset was that Citizens Alliance will be a party that will not be anchored around one person. Because we know the dangers of that. Because when a party is built around one person, and that person is no more, the party disintegrates. Just like um, Chinua Achibe said, the center cannot hold, things fall apart. So what we did was that we ensured that we built the party around and anchored it around a vision, around principles, around values, around systems, around processes. So we agreed that in fact, to ensure the party doesn't revolve around one person, the first leader of this party will be elected at Congress. That is one. So, so like I create the party, Dr. Sisi created the party, imposed himself as the leader, no. Before Congress, before I was elected as party leader, I was just like any other member in the party. The only thing that bound us together, that is the constitution. And in that same constitution, it was agreed by the party that term limits will be inserted in it. That is why we have a term limit. That no leader can be a leader of the Citizens Alliance for more than two, five year terms. And this is in our constitution. And in fact, that is what we took to sell the idea of the party to many people and that is why a lot of people um, bought into the idea of the CA. We are aware that one of the dangers uh, of within political parties in government is a lack of democracy and we don't want the Citizens Alliance to be a party that will be in power and not being relevant. We want to be here for the next two, three hundred years time. I want to lead the party, my term finishes, I go and somebody else will Take over. That is why we have a clear plan of succession within the party. That is why we have what they call the youth shadow in our executive, whereby we 
get young people with the potential to lead. We have what they call the Citizens Alliance Leadership Hub. We train them to become leaders and we attach them to key positions like me so that there's a clear plan of succession. Because uh, I know I wouldn't be leading the party until I grow old. I just do my time and I leave and the work continues. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can go ahead now. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Fatou Nikomloshi from GRTS. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, we've laid out your concerns and they're very much noted. We'll just go back a little bit to your manifesto, as I've read. Uh, Pilar Tu is talking about empowering the citizen. Um, what, what are you looking at here? Because as we speak, we already have institutions that are working in this domain, empowering citizens through skill development gender equality, job creation. So talk to us about what's unique about your empowerment strategy. And uh, secondly, let's look at uh, global pandemics like COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 has pretty much exposed our vulnerabilities. And uh, I, I want to understand, what are your plans in looking into future epidemics if you should be voted into power, uh, especially in terms of working on regional integration towards this dimension, neighboring countries, if you like, collaboration, to prevent future epidemics from penetrating the country. Thirdly, which is going to be the last one, you mentioned um, the state broadcaster uh, obviously championing the, um, the goals of the increment. So talk to us about your plans. As I've seen in your manifesto, it's stated that you have plans for the state uh, broadcaster. How do you intend on going about this? Because as we speak, uh, the state broadcaster is not, is not even on satellite, and it's also an important part of any country's uh, development uh, process? These are my three questions. Thank you very much. These are very brilliant questions. Uh, when it comes to the empowerment of the government citizenry, we've seen that even though, yes, there are institutions created, but they're not fit for purpose. The government citizenry is not empowered. Yes, skills for job creation, but all of our young, most of our young people are unemployed. To the fact that they decide to risk their lives taking the back way and to stay in their own countries. So what was the purpose of those skills training centers? Because why? It is not giving Gambians the opportunities to become what they want to be. Today, our young people are at war with the system. They are disenfranchised. They are frustrated. They feel hopeless. There are no jobs. There are no economic opportunities. They cannot even fulfill their own dreams. Look at our health sector. If you want to empower the citizenry, you must provide a proper health sector for the citizenry. Today, our health sector is in shambles. We cannot cure our own people. If you go to the hospital, there are no medicines. There are no equipment. There is not even blood. People die in our hospitals because there is no blood. Something as simple as blood. We don't have it in our hospitals. Our education sector is, 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 from, is not fit for purpose. It is not producing Gambians to be able to take care of their own destinies. You see, the education sector in any country is supposed to do two things. To solve current problems and to help you build the society you want in the future. It's not doing both. Because our problems today are not solved by our education sector. So what we are saying is that we want to harness Gambia's resources and invest it in people. To make sure that every Gambian, every Gambian, no matter where you are, look at the inequality today or the inequity today. Those in certain parts of the country have access to good education. Those in certain parts don't have access to good education. Why should that happen? And we live in the same country. Those in certain parts have access to good medical health care. Those in other parts don't have access to good medical health care. Why should that happen? We say it, 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 is, it is the same country. A child born in one part of the country has the opportunity to fulfill his or her dreams to become a pilot or an engineer, but a child born somewhere else cannot. So what we are trying to say is that we need to invest in our people, and that is not what is happening now. We need to ensure that every child born in this country lives a dignified life. And I think that is the difference, and that is not what is happening now. We, our young people, are even those who are employed, are exploited. They are paid less than the value of their labor. I was reading a report yesterday, you are a journalist. That 34% of our journalists are paid less than $2,500 a month. What can that do for you? If you have a family of three, a bag of rice is $1,500. So it's only $1,000 is remaining. That goes to cash power. What do you eat? That is why our journalists are finding it very difficult to do their job properly. And people blame them sometimes that where are government journalists? But good journalism goes with a full stomach. 
you cannot go to work thinking of the problems at home. You are at work trying to interview and do your work. Here yeah, you are thinking that I have a family at home. They have not eat, eat, eaten breakfast. You cannot do your job properly. How do we ensure? We said that's why we said decent jobs. That governments have decent jobs that pay. That pay in every sector, from the police to the army to nurses to journalists, they must be paid the value of their labor. They must be paid a living wage so they can be able to feed their families and live a dignified life. So the second question has to be COVID-19, obviously. COVID-19, just like other pandemics that we will face, um, these are global pandemics. And it doesn't only require collaboration between, within regions, Senegambia, Pisa, but even globally. And I think what the Gambia has not done is to create institutions that are resilient to this type of diseases. And I think going forward, we are going to learn from this. We are going to invest more in the scientific research that is needed to create more resilient societies. And that is not what is happening now. Our healthcare sector is overwhelmed, with the, not even with the, with the COVID-19, but even other diseases in the country. We cannot even take care of our health needs in this country. And COVID-19 kind of overstretched this and laid bare our vulnerabilities. The idea is that we have to make sure we build a resilient healthcare sector to ensure that we are not vulnerable to pandemics like this. And these are going to be recorded. COVID-19 is one. But we are bracing ourselves for more of this kind of pandemics, global pandemics. So I mean, what the government is to do is to invest more in the healthcare sector, basically. Especially with the, in the field of tropical research and communicable disease research. We need to do that and work together with MRC and other institutions. If you look at our manifesto, we even proposed more collaboration with our neighbor Senegal by creating, in fact, a center for research, which will house both at UTG and say Antajo. Because our problem will face common problems, common threats, environmental threats, diseases, and so on and so forth. So if, you, if two countries face common threats, they must find common solutions. And to find common solutions, you must get the right data. And currently, it, it is sad that Gambia and Senegal don't even operate at that level. By having a common research institution where we do research together, to solve our common problems. So the idea is to invest more in our healthcare sector to ensure that we build a more resilient healthcare sector, um, invest more in research, invest more especially scientific research. I mean, we have good science, Gambian scientists who are living abroad. How do we engage those diaspora scientists who are experts in these fields? How, to, how do we bring them here to come and help support build this, this system? Now, when it comes to um, collaboration with other countries, obviously, like I uh, said, um, this is key. It is unfortunate that Gambia trades less with Senegal than we do with China or France, yet we are neighbors. And it's very clear in our manifesto what we want to do, to push for deeper integration in areas where we have common interests, certain common policies. I think if we are to have an integrated Africa or West Africa, it starts with Gambia and Senegal should be the pilot because of the nature of our societies. I mean, we, our people are the same. We speak the same languages. If you look at geographically, if you look at history. So I think Gambia and Senegal has a, has a, lot, of, a lot of potential within those, these, these two countries, resource-wise, uh, fighting transnational crime, um, working together to fight COVID-19. And we have not even seen that during the COVID-19. It seems like both con all countries were working in isolation. But I think there's a lot of potential for Gambia and Senegal to work together. That is why sometimes I don't see myself as being inside Senegal. I see myself as living side by side with Senegal. And that should be the spirit. How do we work with Senegal? Because we cannot go without each other. So it is crucial that we come up with policies that can ensure that our peop two peoples benefit from that. Uh, in terms of trade, in terms of agriculture, in terms of infrastructure, uh, you name it. Because our young people are facing the same, the same, the same problem. That is why, if you listen to the news, the uh, backway phenomenon is affecting both Gambian and Senegalese youth. So, how do we ensure, in fact, that we collaborate in this in these areas? It's key. GRTS should be revamped and restructured, and there should be a lot of investment on GRTS. GRTS is the state broadcaster. It has a key role to play insofar as civic education is concerned. Um, so therefore, it's unfortunate that still 
if you look at JRTS from, I think it's, it was established in 1994, um, if I get that right. Yeah. After 20 something years, it is still where it is. Because we see it as an instrument of political mobilization for the president always, whoever, whatever president comes in. We want to ensure it, is, it becomes an independent media entity that will serve the Gambian people because it is funded by the Gambian people. It is not funded by the president. It must play its right role in society, in promoting culture, in promoting tradition, in educating the people, and also in entertaining the people. Today, JRTS should have different, different branches. JRTS Sports, JRTS Entertainment, J but that's not happening. You look at the content of JRTS all day, all night, is the agenda of the president from morning to evening. We might as well buy it and make it a private media house and call it Baro, Baro Entertainment. Not the, it's not a gam, it's not JRTS anymore. It's not, we should not call it JRTS. Because it's been, you see the state capture that has happened in this country is, is disheartening. It is disheartening. It's not playing its proper role. So we must invest in JRTS, restructure it, make it more independent to serve the Gambian people. That is what it should do. We've seen other state broadcasters in other countries, BBC and others, the role they play in promoting culture, promoting reconciliation. Uh, they play a key role, especially targeting education for our kids. So we want to make sure GRT become an independent entity that will serve its purpose in the country. We invest in it and make sure they get the modern equipment and create a modern media house that can serve the Gambian people. Thank you very much. Do we have another? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Then. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, my name is Omar Ferry. I'm a freelance tourist for the program and also Joyce Kemp. Um, I want to um, bring to your attention on the issue of corruption. Um, you've been um, highlighting corruption, so facing with the current government and reports um, being on um, showing um, some signs of corruption that happened recently with the Israel's Minister and also um, other sectors. I want to know um, how Citizens Alliance is going to tackle the issue of corruption. Um, because I understand leadership doesn't only happen, um, doesn't only based on the head, but state institutions you mentioned. Um, if the state institutions are corrupt, obviously we also understand that the head must also be corrupt. I want to understand how Citizens Alliance is going to empower or bring forward people who at the end of the day will not be corrupt in your system to make sure that we continue with the working direction that citizens areas want to be. Second, also with um, the awarding of contract, I have, I want to know how citizens areas would come up with policies or agendas in terms of giving contract to other, like the changes that we see exploiting our leaders and other um, companies that are exploiting our money resources. I want to know, with the use of our new contract, how Citizens Alliance is going to come up in terms of partnership on how to award contract so that it can favor the country but not um, order um, this reason. So those are the two questions I have. Thank you very much. I think the issue of corruption is very critical. Um, I mentioned earlier on that one of the reasons why we are underdeveloped as a country and still dependent on handouts is because of corruption. The amount of money we lose through corruption on a yearly basis for me can be able to fund most development projects in this country. We could have diverted that money and invested in our people. Yet looking from independence to date, I haven't seen any blueprint, any strategy from any previous government in terms of the, the way they want to fight corruption. And that is unfortunate. Now, if you want to understand corruption in the Gambia and how to solve it, look at one word, one letter in fact. Let's start with one letter I. And the word is incentives. At both levels. Corruption happens because of incentives. And to fight corruption, you must go and look at incentives. In the sense that, if you don't provide incentives for, for people to do their job in a corrupt-free environment, then there's a problem. But also you provide them the incentives to have access to cash. Here people are in office, people have access to cash. There are incentives. So if, you, if somebody needs, like the journalists, are, the journalists I'm talking about, they receive 2,400 a month. Now let's say the average journalist with his family needs $10,000 to survive every month. You pay the journalist 2,500. That's a deficit of 7,500. 
where will he get the money from? And then you put him in an office where there's an incentive to get access to cash. Then there's a problem. So we have a strategy to fight corruption. And this strategy is threefold. One force is education. Because it was unfortunate that when you interact with some people who are in public service, they tend to even engage in activity they think is normal, a standard operation in government. For example, if you give service to someone in an, in an official capacity and that person is happy with the service and gives him money, you think it's normal. No. We need to go and catch our citizens young to teach them about ethics and integrity in the public service and professionalism. So there's a clear line for them to know what belongs to them and what belongs to the state and how to operate if you are working as a public official. Like I said, education system is supposed to solve our current problems, but it is not. Corruption and integrity in the public service is one of our problems today. But I haven't seen any course in the curriculum that teaches our young people about these things. Not only education at the school level, but even when you are in the public service, there should be continuous training on corruption. So that's the education bit. The second bit is incentives. We must ensure that public servants are paid and motivated so they cannot engage in corruption. But the third bit is punitive measures. Since this government came to power, I haven't seen anybody that has been dragged to the courts for economic crimes. And every day you see public servants, so uh, public servants who are building mansions in this country, driving big cars. We see it on a daily basis. So life, uh, lifestyle audits, must, you know, they do lifestyle audits. In Germany, uh, if you are uh, a public official and they see you drive a car, and they calculate that this car, it will take you 20 years to walk to buy this car, they'll come and audit you. How did you buy this car? So lifestyle audits must be done in this country. And make sure we put in stringent laws, stringent measures, deterrent. To say if you are caught, yes, we'll educate you, we'll give you the incentive, we'll pay you good money to do your work, but if you are caught with corrupt practices, then that's it. In China, what they do is they, it's this treason, they kill you. Because stealing, in pub, stealing public money is worse than anything you can do. It's akin to the junglers. The junglers torture you, they kill you physically. Those who are corrupt, they kill you slowly. Because of corruption, if you steal from the public's purse, it deprives the public the money to buy blood, to ensure there is a good healthcare system, to ensure there is good education. So you are depriving a whole generation of access to the things they need to live a dignified life. So we should take it seriously and make sure that we build strong institutions. I'm still surprised that the Anti-Corruption Commission is still not in place. We must set up strong institutions and empower them with every resource that the state has to go after those who are found wanting of corrupt practices by creating even corruption marshals, a special task force to fight corruption. Not only for those who receive, but even those who, in, who want to corrupt you. Serious war. So once you build those deterrent measures, and the human mind is rational, and they realize that, look, my job is secure. People must have a secure job. My pay is good. I have the incentives. Why should I engage in corruption and go for 30 years in prison? So we need to come up. We, at, if you read our manifesto, it is clearly stated what we want to do to fight corruption in terms of the strategies, in terms of the lifestyle audits, in terms of digitizing government, how government does business. So there is cash, less cash in dealing with government officials. So you need to create those institutional mechanisms to ensure that we digitize government, that most payments are done, not in the offices. You go to the bank, you make your payment, and then you get the service you get. But ensuring also that even within institutions, there are clear guidelines in how to ensure that leakage doesn't happen. So we are very serious about corruption. The second issue has to do with um, contracts. Yes. See, every country, whatever contract engagement you do, it has to be in the interest of the country. And uh, it still comes down to institutions. That is why we focused on governance and building strong institutions. If you don't have strong institutions, there is a problem. Independent institutions, state institutions, who, are, who cannot be corrupted by the executive. And th in that way, now, you can ensure. And you don't only create, you only st also staff them with competent people. 
merit-based employment in the system. Not based on nepotism. Because if I'm president and I employ my cousin as head of the, comp the, the institution responsible for giving contracts, then there's a problem. You put people there who are competent, you give them the independence and you empower them to do their job. And I think every contract should be based on the national interest. But you cannot be signing contracts that are destructive to our country. The Semlex contract is destructive to the Gambia. It's not good. Yet we went ahead and signed it. The, the fish meal factories is bad for the country. They are depleting our fish resources. They are polluting our environment. What is the Gambia getting from it? The black sand mine contract they give is not good for the country. How much is Gambia? How much are the people of Bato, Kunku, Sanyang, and Tenji getting from the black sand, which is under their area? It's not benefiting them. The young people of Bato Kunku don't even get a football field from this, or a youth development center, or a multi-purpose center, not even a library. One man is benefiting from this whole entire thing. The Banjul contract they gave to build that, that road in Banjul for political purposes. They gave it to one man. Look at the kind of the quality of the roads they built. It means in, they are so bad that in 10, 15 years, they will have to go and redo it again. That is why we think it is important, in fact, today, to have an act in parliament, an act of parliament, which is called the Welfare of Future Generations Act. That whatever we are doing today must take into consideration. If we are building the roads, we must make sure that those roads are built to ensure the welfare of future generations. Even if we are giving contracts, these contracts must be ensure, it must not only ensure that Gambians of today benefit from this contract, but it must ensure the welfare of future generations. We are giving away our land, left, right, and center. Even land that was reserved for future generations has been given away now. I have seen recently that I don't know who is building something by the airport. How can you give a whole massive land near the airport to one man to build? For what? What if, if we want to expand our airport in 25 years' time? We cannot expand it. They've sold all the land, all the reserve land around the beach that was supposed to be. Jawara had the foresight to say TDA. That every land 800 meters from the shoreline to the coast is reserved for future generations. They've sold everything. They are cutting every land. Today, in the combo, there is no land. Even if you come with a billion dollars to say, combo, here is a billion dollars, build a modern hospital, there is no land to build it. Build a modern stadium for the young people, there is no land to build it. A country cannot go, the way we are going in this country is very dangerous. And we are not paying attention to these things. It will come and caught up with us in the future. Then by the time it's too late, we are destroying our environment. So when you give contracts, government must ensure they do feasibility studies. What are the environmental impacts? This company we are giving contractor, will he respect our environmental laws? Will he respect our labor laws? Will he reinvest the, some of the profits back into our economy? So there's no capital flash. So people don't come and exploit our resources, exploit our young people, exploit our country and go. And leave us with the mess. But we will go as well and leave our kids with the mess. We don't want to hand over that country to the next generation. That's a massive failure on our part. And the way things are going, our country was far better off 25 years ago, 50 years ago than we are now. And it will get worse in 25 years' time if the current trends continue, if we don't reverse what is happening. And I think these are things that Gambians must pay attention to. That the country doesn't belong to us. It belongs to us also, but next generation. So when we are giving our land, Think of the welfare of future generations. When you are signing contracts, think of their welfare. When you are building roads, think of their welfare. We don't just build roads for political purposes. We build roads to ensure socio-economic development. But once the focus is on one man entrenching himself to the detriment of the entire development planning, then there's a problem. And today the problems are many. 60% of our population are living in urban Gambia. That is a big problem. It's a big mess. Because there's nothing in rural Gambia. No hospitals, no schools, no jobs, nothing. But urban Gambia was not built for 60% of our population. The water infrastructure was not built for 60% of our population. The electricity grids are not built for 50% of our population. The roads are not built for that. That is why there is so much traffic congestion everywhere. 
The houses are not enough. That is why, because of that pressure, 100% hike in house prices. And the landlords are exploiting our people. There are no institutions to protect the tenants. The prices go up left, right, and center. Crime is in the increase. So many young people in urban Gambia, no jobs, frustrated, hopeless. That is why people are building the way they want. Because there is so much profit in building Luas Bungo. Every building Luas Bungo and Alimpitiko everywhere. That's why I need some amount of flooding everywhere because there are no planning in the way we are building. We think that the flooding, you know, it used to rain the same rain five, ten years ago. But because of the pressure, the many houses we are building, left, people build left, right, and center. Petrol station anywhere. There are places that should not have petrol stations. It's not, it's not a hell hazard. Building stores everywhere. Building. When was the last time you see we build a social amenity for our people? A library, for example. When? Why is the library? Why are the football fields? Why are the multipurpose centers? Nowhere to be found. We sold everything we have. We sold, we mortgaged the future generations of this country. We are taking loans in the billions to fund political projects at the detriment of we are going to, our kids are going to pay for it. They'll be indebted. You take loan to go and sponsor a Kulu or a Manyobito, and your child will pay for that loan. You blew it just like that. You're not investing it on your child's education or child's health care. And we think things are okay in this country. And we go about our businesses like things are normal. It will come to catch up with us at some point. Thank you. Um, I just have one question. Um, finally, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned about reforms. Um, I heard of the election first, 2021. I want to know whether Citizens Alliance have any plans to engage other political party to achieve in these reforms that we are talking about in 2021. Not only the political, we want to even engage the, the president because he's a stakeholder as well. I think now is the time for us to sit as political stakeholders to create a framework for 2021 election. So everybody is on the same line. So there's consensus as to the rules of the game, as to who is going to referee it, as to the roadmap. This must be clear now. We cannot go for elections without this happening. It is very important for us to sit all political stakeholders, civil society, and have a clear roadmap that we have consensus in, that we agree that these are the rules. We agree that these are the reforms that are needed, and we go for it. Because otherwise, it will cause problems at the end of the day. Like I said, there should not be any ambiguities insofar as the rules of the game are concerned. You cannot wait until you go to the field on the day of the game and you start questioning certain things. Oh, okay, is the referee qualified when the game is about to start? Oh, are the rules okay? Are the linesman qualified? The linesman qualified? Are the lines properly drawn? You, you, we start now. So when we approach the game, everything is set. So we know our expectations. But if that doesn't happen, it is going to cause problems for this country going forward. Go ahead. My name is Art Samara from the Back Network. Um, I have two questions, and the other one is um, we have seen oppositions, uh, the opposition parties remind the government of this failure, and we've also seen um, the opposition complain that uh, um, the government do not open doors to work with them. So, do you think it would be okay if the opposition uh, parties all come together and find ways to work together? For example, the issue of corruption that you're talking about. Well, thank you. The first question um, is a very relevant question, obviously. What can political, opposition political parties do 
to solve some of these problems. Um, we've always argued that opposition political parties are not only supposed to oppose government. They are supposed to provide alternative policy solutions. That is why I even went as far as saying that I don't want people to call us opposition. I want them to call us alternative parties and not opposition parties. Because we've gone beyond the system where political power just oppose and oppose and oppose without providing alternatives to, to, to government. Well, when it comes to implementing, when it comes to action, only government can do it because they have the wherewithal, they have the state resources to do it. A political party cannot arrest anybody for corruption. What we can do on our part is to put pressure on government to act, to hold them accountable for their actions. Yes, holding them accountable, to keep them on their toes, to provide alternative policy solutions that government wants to do X. We say, no government, if you do X, it's not good. You should do Y. Because this is what we will do when we come to power, and we give reasons why we think they should do Y. For now, it's important that that is, what the, that is the role that every political party should play. Every political party in this country must hold government accountable. But also, we must also hold ourselves accountable as political parties as well. Because recently we've seen a lot of hate speech in this country. Political parties have a role to play in promoting peace, in promoting reconciliation, and holding government accountable. And I think this is, that is the role we can play. And that is what the CA is doing very effectively in making sure that the government does the right thing. And that is the role we are playing. Now, when it comes to the presidential tour, it's a farce. It's a disgrace. I mean, how can you take taxpayers' money in the millions of dollars with all this COVID-19 recovery that is happening? Businesses are struggling. People are suffering. The economy is bad. In fact, the projections for the economy are even worse. Now, you go on a political tour and you call it meet the people, meet the farmers, to tell them what? when they have already done their farming already. To tell them what? And in fact, I haven't seen anything that has to do with talking to the people. What I've seen is politics, pure and partisan politics. How can a cross carpet issue be an issue of a meat farmer store? How can it be? Cross carpet. Using our state resources to organize an event where people cross carpet. So it, it, is, it is really sad and unfortunate that we still find ourselves in the same situation. The same things we condemned not so long ago are the same things we are doing still today. You see, nations develop. They move from A to B, B to C, until they reach Z. But we are moving from A to I don't even know what. And it, not even minus. I mean, we are, we are regressing. Politically. It doesn't make any sense that we, people died. Solo Sandeng died at Westfield. Many people were tortured in torture chambers. People lost their lives fighting for reforms, fighting for a better, more democratic Gambia. Yet today, here we are. We are doing the same things that those people died for. And we think it is okay. And we think it doesn't affect us. It doesn't affect us today, but tomorrow is going to affect us. It is going to affect our children. And I think that is where everybody has a role to play. Civil society, media, political parties to hold this government account to say, well, you know what, you are, what you are doing is wrong. And for me, again, I emphasize, we have to do the right thing. The reforms must take place. Otherwise, it will be a grave betrayal of the Gambian people, a grave betrayal of those who died. If we go for 2020 elections without the reforms, it doesn't make any sense. With regards to the draft constitution and then the 1907 constitution, um, I think uh, our leaders are not giving us hope that the draft constitution will come to existence in a short period. Now you talk about the amendment of the 1907 constitution. Why are you limiting yourself to the three provisions of the 1907 constitution? That is the uh, diaspora voting and then the 50 plus one and then also the presidential term limit. Why are you missing yourself to win this dream? Because you have other provisions that need to be amended. Considering the context and the situation, uh, these are critical. I mean, these are kind of pillars in ensuring the consolidation of our democracy. Yes, other provisions are important. But I think these ones are the most critical ones for now to ensure that legal framework is right for the elections. 
The what? That is not in the con that is that has to do with electoral laws. Those ones they are working on that with the electoral laws. Those ones can be changed without going to the constitution. But these ones are entrenched clauses. This ones has to be changed in the 97 constitution. Now those that can be changed in the electoral laws, fine. Because I think they are going to table it next week in parliament. But when it comes to this critical one, these are key. Because the problem is that if we don't put the time limit now, and the government is scheming a conspiracy to defraud the Gambian people, what are they doing now? They took this bill to parliament, the CRC bill to parliament. They masterminded its failure and they killed it. Now, to deceive the Gambian people and the international community, they are crying now. Say, we are going to revive it. They went and brought in one, I don't know, one, they call him or her an eminent person. Who told them Gambians cannot solve their own problems? Who told them Gambians lack eminent people to lead the process? And then so we have a proper constitution. So the idea is now they want to show us that they have a, they, are, they care about the constitution. They are working on it. So before it's done, it's sometime mid next year. Then the, so it means that, and if there is no time limit before elections, it means that this term is not counted. Next term will not be counted. Until the term after that, after 2020, after 2031. The whole idea is a conspiracy to ensure that the current president stays until 2080. So what is the difference? Why are we, why, why are we shouting at the Ajame then? Why? If we say one of our problems in this country was self-perpetuating rule, <clears throat> and if you look at the, 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 the coalition manifesto, and the, in fact the agreement, the MOU was based on that, that to avoid self-perpetuating rule, the person who is going to lead the transition is going to be serving only for three years. And then we'll do the necessary reforms and go for elections. The idea was that we are going to inject a new political culture into our polity. For the first time in the history of this country, there was going to be a president who will leave power without being forced out. That means a lot for the Gambia. And that could mean a lot for the Gambia going forward. And that was derailed as well. Not only did they fail the tra about the transition, but they are doing the same things that is undermining the development on this country and the democratic potentials of this country. So the issue is that these things must be, the time limit must be put in the constitution. I don't know, it's for the legal experts to work with the Minister of Justice and the government to go and do the right amendment. If there is a referendum, we work on it now. The time they are wasting in trying to revive the CRC draft, they could have expended that time and the money to go and focus on what reforms can we do with the 97 country and ensure that 2021, everything is, at least we don't have the, uh, an entire constitution, but at least the fundamentals that is going to ensure a democratic process, at least they are there. But if that does not happen, if we allow a situation where we go to 9, 2021 elections with no single reform, not even a single one, then what was the purpose of the transition then. I think that's even an insult to the Gambian people. Um, just, yeah, if I'm, if I'm, I just ahead. wanted to add on to what Nelson has asked. I think the question, the context in which you've explained this, um, that is to say these critical areas that need to be looked at for this upcoming presidential election can be in a way justified. But from another context, let's look at it from a citizen's con uh, context. And what would happen if you, by, you know, if you happen to win the presidential election, will you again, re, you know, walk towards reviving this draft constitution? Because in this draft, these three areas have been catered for. But then again, there are a whole lot of laws that some citizens are also calling on to be repealed. So if you happen to be voted, would you make this draft also your priority? Of course. I think the draft was... <laughs> The, 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 the draft is a progressive draft. For the first time in our history, the, the, the constitution building process was consultative and participatory. Every Gambian took part, even those in the diaspora. Yes, it was in the most perfect document. I mean, the whole idea of building a constitution is, a, is fraught with challenges and complexities. Now, the idea was that it was supposed to go for, it was supposed to be negotiations and give and takes, but that wasn't even, the chance wasn't even given. So when we come to power, we will make sure that we go and revisit that draft and make sure we work on it 
to build consensus, a national consensus on the draft. So when it goes to parliament, at least the majority of governments will accept it as the constitution of the Republic of the Gambia. Thank you very much. You can go ahead. I have a number of questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to make them like I've spent a lot of time with So the first one is about the inter-party committee. What role is CA playing in that? Obviously, that is where the big talking points, sort of this, you know, what you were highlighting, we need to meet the president and all that. Um, what is also CA's position on ballot papers or so tell us what CA is thinking, what are they interested in. My third question, um, you had the infamous you know, disagreement with President Barrow on security sector issues. Um, ECOMIC is still here. Uh -huh. Since when they came into this country, huh? has there been any progress on this front since that time where, you, where you, we know all it's well documented what happened, what you said? Um, is the president confident enough to act like a commander in chief and take charge of his security chiefs and security institutions? What's your, what's your take? Thank you very much, uh, Yusuf. Those are very important questions. Now, for the IPC, the IPC is doing a great work, obviously, um, in also trying to ensure that there is a fair process come 2021. Now, CAA has just become a member of the IPC. We are a new political party obviously, and the membership to IEC sometimes, um, it took us at least a while before we became a member. Um, it was only recently that we started engaging at the IPC level. We have just uh, identified people from the party who are going to be permanent members of the IPC. So going forward, we will obviously, because we see the IPC as playing a critical role in this whole scheme of things. Uh, because of one, all parties are part of the IPC, including the president's party. So we see it as a forum, as a platform, also to initiate some of these dialogues. Um, so we are, we've just been a member. We've just identified people who are going to be members there for representing the party there. And we hope to continue this discussion at the IPC level. Ballot paper marble. See, this is a very contentious issue. Both have advantages and disadvantages. The ballot paper, the marble has been proven to be rig proof and transparent. And it has worked for the Gambia uh, for many years since independence. For us, we are very open minded. We think that, yes, if we think that the ballot paper is better for Gambia now, considering that the diaspora would also want to vote, and also considering the number of political parties in the country. It is worth giving it a try. I mean, I worked as an international elections observer in many countries where they use the ballot paper. And I've seen how they worked, even though, yes, there are some weaknesses. Our main concern is that it cannot be used and tested and experimented in high stakes elections in 2021 for the first time if you don't put certain safeguards in place. One is you must do proper, proper, proper civic education for people to understand how it works. Because a simple malpractice or perception of malpractice in the system can really derail the whole entire process and can have implications for stability in this, especially post-election stability. So it's either the IEC, if they want, they think it's important for us to um, implement it, they embark on a massive civic education exercise or even if the money is available to do a simulation exercise where people try it practically and see what are the weaknesses so we can work on them before the elections. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense, it would be dangerous to test it in a high stakes election for the first time. Yes, going forward we might have to use it, but perhaps it could be tried in the local government election to start with because those are not high stakes. But for me, the way things are going, if this is the where things are going, with no proper civic education, with, no, with the voters not properly sensitized on how it is used. And just going into the elections like that, we think it is, it is, it is dangerous and we will not support it. When it comes to the security sector reform, ECOMIC are still in this country. I think we've made our position clear on many occasions. ECOMIC came to play a role as a stabilization force uh, at some point. And they are not supposed to stay this long. 
And my advice to the president at that time was that you must build the confidence and the trust of the army. That is what will be good for the long-term stability of this country. That economics long-term stay in this country is not what will lead to stability in this country. At that time, we are not thinking along the lines of uh, we are mostly human security, and we are seeing it now. Um, and I think the president that and that is still our advice. And what saddens source is that we haven't seen any exit strategy for economic yet, because if economic has been here for four years, they will not wake up one morning and leave. No. They leave a security vacuum. You create an exit strategy, say 18 months. To say, ECOMEG will leave this particular day. And the transition will start now, which will be transparent so we know. And prepare our men and women in uniform to be in charge of the security of this country. But I think ECOMEG's long term stay here is not good for the long term peace and stability of this country. And I think the government should start working on ECOMEG's exit strategy. When are they leaving? Economic being here, in fact, after for the 2021 elections, it's not that mix is not even good. It's not good. They shouldn't be here up, up to the elections. They should be leaving before the elections. So the elections don't have any external interferences or the perception of external interferences. So and this is key, and this is still our position. Now, when it comes to the commander in chief, the, is he acting like a commander in chief? And is he capable of? Marshalling his security chiefs and institutions. <laughs> well, there are many ways in which you can do that. You don't have to be shouting and being in front of them to show that you are a proper commander in chief. The most important thing is you have trust and confidence in your men in uniform and let them feel that you depend on them for the security of this country. And we have not seen that chemistry between the commander in chief and the, we've seen the uh, we've seen a kind of a gulf between the president himself and the and the and the security infrastructure. Uh, partly because of also the presence of ECOMIC and the perception that the president uh, trusts more ECOMIC in terms of his security than our, our security forces. And I think he should work to ensure that he instills that confidence in our security officers and work towards the security sector reform. I mean, all the, all the security sector documents have been validated. What is remaining is implementation. What are they waiting for? You see, it is dangerous to have a country whereby the pop when we say democracy has arrived, the population shifted to democracy mode instantly. But the state is still in autocracy mode. That's a very dangerous mix. We must ensure that the state itself now, especially security institutions, <coughs> are reoriented to act and think like they're in a democratic setting. And this is important for stability. And we've seen what happened. We've seen when there is a, uh, when there is a conflict somewhere. We see Faraba, Busumbala, We've seen what happens, how the security reacts to some of these things. To avoid this kind of situations, I think the security sector reform must be expedited. And we must ensure that economic term is put to an end progressively and hand over the security of this country to our men and women. Thank you very much. We're going to take um, two more questions uh, before this press conference comes to an end. And uh, I want to, yeah, I want to give a, quick, a chance, and you, you will do the last one. Uh, one, one. Go, go, go ahead. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, I just want to thank you, Sonia. Dr. Sijan CEO, congratulations for being the president and candidate of CA and the Convention of the Manifesto. Congratulations. Okay. I have three questions uh, for you, Dr. Sisa, and one is regarding the reform that you are talking about, the election reform. I was uh, get a chance to attend the IPC. Uh, conference that they were reviewing the electoral act and they have uh, all political parties have been there. You know, they came with their recommendations what they want to see if uh, is expected to be before the National Assembly before the end of the present sittings so that they will reform and political parties have come with their recommendations. Uh, I don't know whether CA was not informed about the whole process and if they are informed why CA is not there. And if you are not informed what you say, like what you said, whether CA will forward their recommendation to the IPC so that it can be a group form rather than an individual one. And the second one is regarding the two by-elections that has taken place uh, in this country. Uh, one could have seen CA being taken part as a new political party to stamp its authority in the political arena, but we have not seen CA and why. And the third one is regarding uh, Flex, what he asked regarding the term limit. And your answer is that CA has a constitution that talks about two term limits. So, for example, if doctor is elected, Dexter happens to be the flag bearer and contested in the 2021 elections, 
and who could not win and he go for 20, uh, 26 election. And Dr. Hapu used to be as the presidential candidate of CEO. Whether the third time, because the constitution said only two times, Dr. Hapu decided somebody to go to the constitution of CEO. These are brilliant questions, huh? <laughs> very, very sweating, sweating questions. Now, the reforms and the IPC. Um, at some point, we were engaged by the IEC. We attended the first event. And we were all set to attend that stakeholders meeting, especially at the party leader level. And we got a call that I think there was some miscommunication as to the draft that was brought by the Minister of Justice and the one that the IEC was having, that there are some inconsistencies. So therefore, that event was... Um, Cancelled. For the second one, we did not get any communication. Uh, I just saw it online. So we were not engaged. Even if we were, we don't know how that was done, or maybe there is some miscommunication somewhere. And we've always advocated for the IPC to be the most effective medium to pursue some of these reforms. And we will be ready to work with the IPC. And obviously, like you said, we will uh, heed your advice to see what we can do to still engage the IPC and forward our recommendations to the IPC. Um, so, thank you for that. For the by-elections in Nyamina, we wanted to take part in that process. But as a party that was formed, that was established in 2019, last year, the COVID-19 pandemic kind of hampered most of our work, especially in that part of the uh, country. Because when the COVID-19 struck, some of the art you are doing in terms of you know, building the base around that part, it stopped totally, so we did not do any activity there. And now it is coincided now with the elections after that, and we thought that uh, we were not ready at that time to put up candidates in Nyamina or um, Kirtjarga. That was, that was it. We thought we did an assessment. In fact, we sent a team to the area to do an assessment as to are we ready. Because elections are only also about finances as well. Um, if you don't have the right finances, you cannot go for these elections. And because of the and because CA is not a party funded by donors who give us millions, the party is funded by ourselves and a few sympathizers, sympathizers who donate us to do our activities. Uh, we thought that financially we are not in the right position um, to put up a candidate. So therefore, we we let that pass. Um, the other one with the time limit within CA. Many people have brought this to our attention that the constitution says two term. What if Dr. C.C. loses the, uh, doesn't win 2021 and then wins in 2026? And many people have raised this issue. For now, as it is, that is what the constitution says. And we will go by that for now. Um, what happens in the future, I don't know. But that is what the constitution says. If that is, if that is what stays in the constitution, obviously we will follow, have to follow the, the constitution because that is what the constitution says. You cannot create a constitution and put provisions and then flout those constitutions, that defeats the purpose of the entire process. It also uh, hampers your integrity as well, and also the legacy you leave behind. So for now, that is what the CA constitution says, and um, we go by that. Thank you very much. Tatu, we have uh, uh, three questions. Uh, the other question is, uh, the thing is, we are having uh, so many serious um, issues in our communities, and the government is not you know, trying to, we don't see the government trying to take in uh, its position to try to mitigate these issues. And one of the issues is the issue of land dispute. This has been um, so, uh, this has been a problem in our communities. Just yesterday, uh, we went to, what's the name of it? yeah. We went to Brufut, and uh, one Kamalpunda uh, family were being, you know, on the verge of being evicted from their home, which they claim to buy and be uh, staying there for about like 10 years now. And uh, they said, uh, someone went there and said, the sheriff, from the sheriff's office, they said they get order that if these people must evict uh, this compound. And it's about like 22 compounds at that area. And that's not the other, uh, those are not the only people that we've been to and seen this kind of problem. And we see group group also. And then we also see um, Sukuta. A lot of problems of land dispute happening in this country. And these are things that are very serious. The other issue is the issue of the Supreme Islamic Council. Uh, as we speak right now, uh, we have two Supreme Islamic Councils in this country, and they are getting worse day by day. And in fact, the second one, that is those that claim to be 
the new Supreme Islamic Council are calling on the president to step in and do something before things get worse. These are very serious things that um, we think uh, the government should have stepped in. Uh, what advice do you have for the government in this issue? And the other thing is the issue of the sex workers, right? <laughs> Nobody knows where these phones, like, sorry, some knows, but then, like, it do not matter where the phones came in uh, to give this really package to sex workers. But the thing is, uh, sex working is not legalized in this country. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, difficult questions. Again, contentious questions. Uh, the first one has to do with um, the land disputes in this country. Um, we've obviously said that the way this, the trend in which this land issues are going, it can have security implications for this country. And we've seen it. We've seen what happened in Salaji, we've seen what happened in Sukuta, in Sumbala, in Mahmuda, and these places. And I think the government should really take this land issue seriously and come up with solutions to this problem. It's a bit complex uh, because the land tenure the problem is, is in the land tenure system. What we need is the land commission must be empowered to do its job. And there must be proper, proper land reform. And there must be proper regulation of the way land is bought and sold in this country, especially with the estate agents. I mean, could you believe that there is nobody that authorizes and regulates the estate agents? So I think government should really take this land issue seriously and make it a top priority because it has security implications. Now, when it comes to the um, Supreme Islamic Council, um, I think we will let them solve that problem. Um, it's a problem that is, I mean, we are CE, we don't have, we don't want to get involved. I mean, what advice do you have for the government? To, 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 to mediate. To mediate, to, to call both parties and talk to them and find a solution. Obviously, I believe that the problem, I don't think it is not solvable. The Supreme Islamic Council must have a constitution. They must have their bylaws. So it's about mediation. Because if the, the problem, like you said, it can get out of hand. I think this is the time now for the government to really create a team that can start the mediation process. People who are neutral, um, religious-wise. So I think because it is key, it should be paid attention to. The final question has to do with the sex workers and the, um, the relief package, which has been dominating the headlines recently. Um, we have not, as a party, really taken a position on that. Um, but what we can say is that um, if the profession is not legal, if it's not legal, then we see no reason why they should be given the relief package. Where we have businesses who are struggling in this country, and they are not given relief packages. So, so for us, I think the position is, is very clear that the relief package are for those who are contributing to society in one way or the other, paying taxes to this country. So it wouldn't make sense if we start giving a relief package to business that operate underground. It means also start giving relief package to thieves as well. Because thieves are also, no, yeah, just call thieves and tag and relief package. If that is the case. It must focus first and foremost on businesses that are recognized, that pay taxes, and that we can support, and that contribute to the economy, and to the social well-being of this country. That is, that, is the, that is the bottom line. So if you start giving it to business that operate under the grada illegal, it doesn't make sense. So start giving it to thieves, and fraudsters, and arm robbers. Call arm robbers and say, well, relief package for arm robbers as well. It's, it's, so for us, that is our position. Just one question. I must say I'm a happy journalist that you are answering all our questions. These are actually all my questions. Um, the last question is regarding something you talked about, political party finance. Uh, you said CA is not a party formed by parties or donors. Now, I must highlight the current mayor, Talib Bensula for KMC, yeah, he openly on his Facebook page declared that an oil company far limited. Uh, funded his political activities. Yeah? It's there. You can go and check. I've been writing about this. Guardians are not up to speed about it. My question here, as we speak, at that stage, it compelled civil society and um, advocates to look at the loss of the damage. There is nothing, there is nothing stopping non guardians huh, and international organizations from funding political activity in this country, capturing our political elite if it hasn't already happened. 
with what you talked about, our minerals and the contracts and all of these things. Huh? What is CA's position on political party financing, declaring it, and also asset declaration, maybe when they come into government or whether, what is your party's position on this? Sorry, and I'm still one question. Do we foresee CA going into coalition with any party? <laughs> with Father Network, yes. <laughs> Now, that's a very important question. You see, one of the things that makes elections free and fair has to do with the financing. Um, there are two aspects here. There is what they call the political economy of corruption, for example. And that means that the government of the day deprives the opposition the necessary financing to, so they can lose elections, because politics is about financing as well. We at the Citizens Alliance, we will advocate for parties to be able to declare their financial audits every year. So we know exactly how much they received from who and how the money is spent. At least we owe that to our members. Publicly. Publicly. In fact, we supported that. You see, that is in the draft constitution, in fact, CRC, that no non-Gambian should sponsor a political party. We supported that. Um, even though it can be complicated. How would you know? I mean, most of this online crowdfunding, how would you know that the person is not a Gambian, even though it's, it's implementation will be a key, will key thing. Now, state capture has been what has been our problem in this country. Where a few elites capture state officials uh, by funding their political activities. And we think that should stop in this country. Because what that, that does is that if you receive money from a particular company to pursue your political goals and you come to power, you are indebted to that particular company. It means that you are there for that company. It means that if that company wants something, which is against the interest of the government people, they get it. That is why we have a very we have a, we have our own internal um, limits within the party that nobody should fund the party this amount, and also where we get our money from. These things are very clear. That is why until today, we are I think we are one of the poorest parties in this country. In fact, at some point when we are establishing the party, one someone suggested or in fact offered to pay the one million dollars for us we said no we said no we want to make sure that everybody is empowered in the party we all contributed to pay the million because if you give us the one million dollars it means you own our party tomorrow you want something from a party we said you cannot get it because of xyz and it's in fact i paid you a million so we don't want to be in a situation where when you come to public we'll be captured by a few people that is why we try to ensure that we don't take money from big donors and give commitments that we think are detrimental to the Gambian people that will also undermine our development aspirations as a, as a party. So for us, the bottom line is we think every party should be able to declare their assets, their finances at the end of every year so we know. But on the other hand also, government must find a CA government will ensure we provide certain amount of financing for political parties, especially when it comes to developing and promoting policy and doing civic education. Because if you don't give parties money, you don't you cannot give them that much money, but at least you should be able to give parties should be able to give some money from government. Not that much, but at least money that they could use to develop policy and also engage in civic education. Because these are good because political parties play a key role, apart from the fact that they hold governments accountable, they also educate the citizenry. Today when you listen to political parties speak the manifesto itself is a book. They teach the citizenry what the country is about. So I think for also to hold political parties accountable, you must also provide certain incentives to political parties. At least to say you cannot give to all political parties, but you can come with a, with a, with a, with a mechanism to say that parties that have a certain threshold in the last election or parties with certain mass of parliament in the, in, the, in the assembly should get support, financial support, only in promote in developing policy because when you develop policy, you do research you have to go around the country collect data but once you get that funding as well you must be able to come and be accountable and tell us how that money was spent in terms of let's say you get thousand dollars to develop policy when you spend it you have to come and give that this is how you so that next year also you can get you can benefit from that funding so obviously for that to happen these, these are two fronts one will promote for the fact that parties must be transparent they must have their finances declared so we know exactly who gave money what. Because if you want the process to be fair, it's not fair for one party to be receiving from anonymous donors. 
pick up trucks and millions of dollars. And the other parties are not receiving anything. The, the process is not fair then. It's not fair. So why do we have elections then? When it needs money to finance political party activities. Secondly, also, so to avoid that, also political parties must be given some support, at least some financial support, to develop policy uh, and also to engage in civic education exercises because that is something which is very important. The citizens must understand the value of their vote. They must know why they should be voting and how their vote should be able to change their lives. You see, there can be no meaningful democracy if the citizenry is not enlightened. Forget about democracy. Democracy itself is premised on choice. People have to make informed choices. But for you to make an informed choice, you must be able to be equipped with the knowledge you need to make that informed choice. Otherwise, the same politics will continue. Politics of bag of rice. You give people bag of rice, you get their voters. That should change in this country. But isn't there a danger that the political parties are implementing civic education and they are, even in civic education, it should be within a non-partisan context. There is a danger for political party to parties uh, to be engaged in civic education, which I, uh, it should be done, but there is also that danger that they politicize <coughs> civic education. Uh, now, when I say civic education, I don't mean parties going directly to the communities and giving education. Why? It's the policy development bit. Because the people must understand exactly what the parties have in store. It's a policy about agenda. Now, for you to develop a clear, concise agenda, which makes sense, you must be able to get the do research and collect the right data. And it, it is in that aspect I'm speaking, but not parties being given money. To, because if you give C money to do civic education. When I go there, I'll be talking about vote for CA. This is CA's agenda. But indirectly as well, once parties get more engaged and they get the support to develop proper policies, that alone also helps in educating the citizens about what is happening in the, in the, in the country. All right. Um, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, no. We, 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 you have a question again? Yeah, a question. Just, it's just the last question. I think it's very important. So there's a question about Sorry. coalition about Yes, you have a question on the coalition. That's a very brilliant question. Uh, and I also said asset declaration. Whether because of currently they are doing asset declarations, but it's not done publicly. It's done to the ombudsman. Uh, will you ensure that if a CA government comes into power, whoever comes into office uh, declares their assets, then also when they leave, they declare so that we can see whether in between that period. <laughs> Have you been getting too many mentions? That should be the basic. I mean, if we are saying one to fight corruption, one way to fight corruption is that. One way to ensure transparency and accountability is that. We will promote for that. We, in fact, we've said that many times that, I mean, it didn't make sense that declare access to the ombudsman, but it's private. That doesn't make sense. You'd rather even not declare. This should be public. That anybody who is going to hold a position of responsibility must declare all your assets. So that when you come with one dollar C as president, if you are going out as president, we should know whether you are going out with one dollar or five dollars. So that we can know exactly whether you stole from the public purse or not. We need to set standards in our country. We need to, public officials must set the examples. And I think not only for the presidency, but for every civil servant, even state-owned state -owned enterprises, their directors, their, everybody must have to declare their assets. So we know exactly what's happening. So we will obviously promote that. When it comes to the coalition. Um, currently, Citizens Alliance is focusing on selling its agenda to the Gambian people. Uh, with the hope that the Gambians will buy our agenda and give us a mandate to govern in 2021. So coalition is not something that is in our mind for now. We did not build this party to come and form a coalition. We built this party to develop and design a clear agenda for the Gambian people that we hope the Gambian people will buy this agenda and give us the mandate to govern and transform this country. And currently, that is our focus. Thank you um, very much. Let me just ask this last one. Just, this is the final one. And I think it's important because, like you mentioned, we're on a path to economic recovery. I'm sorry, I'm just uh, focused on plans. And um, as we speak, the Gambia has been on economic recovery since 2017. COVID-19 came and made it even worse because then tourism, of course, there was a decline in 2020. And, and that means 2021 is indeed going to be another turning point so any um, president that comes is going to be faced with, with a huge challenge. And uh, the country is currently in debt distress, with debt vulnerabilities. Do you have confidence in the country's <coughs> macroeconomic policy? If not, what are the <coughs> if not, what are the alternatives? Currently, currently, sorry. Currently, no. 
sorry. The government is not acting like we are in economic distress. In fact, that economic distress is projected. They're not acting like that. If you look at the current budget, if you look at the current budget, they are not act, it's not a government acting in a fiscal responsible way. So what needs to be done, obviously, is to act in a very responsible way when we talk about fiscal responsibility, austerity measures. We must, you see, when you have a problem and you know that the finances are tight, you must cut spending. You must move the austerity measures needed. How do we ensure that we cut the most of the spending happening in government? Just look at the people, money people store. How many million of dollars is are going there? It's a lot of money. So obviously, things will be very difficult going forward. And like you rightly said, our key drivers in terms of our economy are what? Agriculture, remittances, and tourism. And all these are facing pressure and they're also volatile tourism is very volatile it's not in our hands tourism we don't even though it's a key driver of our economy that we have no control over when thomas cook went into administration it brings in 80 percent of of, uh, of 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 tourists into this country last year that alone shook the very foundations for our industry now you have covid 19 on top of that it means that the revenue we are going to generate from tourism has been cut into even less than half Agriculture is not also is our key driver, but it's, between, it's not controlled by us. If the prices are not set by us. The, if global markets uh, falter, we have a problem. We cannot even sell our, our farmers cannot sell their, sell their groundnuts. Remittances are also beyond our control. What are remittances? When Gambians abroad work, they send money. But if there is a financial crisis and they lose their jobs, so even in the long term, it's not even sustainable, remittances. Because the second generation Gambians abroad, we have that link with the Gambia that we send money. My grandchildren will not send money to Gambia. They don't know that. Especially those grandchildren who will grow up in the West, they wouldn't have that link to be sending money back home. That is why it's important for the Gambia to come up with a new economic paradigm that will ensure that we look and how can we really properly harness and tap into our resources to ensure sustainable growth. But that is not happening at the moment. And, 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 and but in the, see, when currently government is a, a short term, medium term, a long term economic recovery plan. In the short term, it's a cut spending. Where can we cut spending? How can we reduce, reduce, control the number of fuel vouchers we give? Utility, telephone, telephone, call, telephone utility bills by public officials, um, electricity bills by public officials, the travels and the paradigms by the public officials, the workshops. Today, almost 80% of our budget is spent on operating government institutions. It's not spent on development. How can we streamline government to ensure it is more efficient and save money? How can we ensure that we go and renegotiate with our partners for debt restructuring? If you are paying 58% of your budget to, to, to debt servicing, it doesn't make sense. How can you repurpose that money to invest in, in social projects? How can we renegotiate with our bilateral and multilateral partners to say, you know what, this is COVID-19. How can we how can we restructure this debt, for example? How can we, how can we even give us debt relief, for example? The long term is to make sure now we invest in these critical sectors. The agro-industry, with all its potential, we are not tapping from it. All we do is we grow groundnuts, we send out. We're not adding value. Look at the poultry industry. I mean, I cannot believe that Gambia, with all this potential for poultry, we are still importing eggs in this country. We are still importing mayonnaise in this country. Look at the livestock industry. We can't even produce the number of ships we need for our Tobaski, despite the potentials in this country to create and establish a massive livestock industry. Well, we'll even be supplying livestock to the neighboring countries. But look at the value chain of the livestock, the milk. How many liters of milk do our cows produce on a daily basis? Yet we still import milk. I mean, Look at the poultry. The only thing we focus in poultry is chicken. Where is the ducks? Where are the... Uh, the, 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 the No, no, I mean, the, when we say poultry here, yeah, the only thing we sell is chicken. But there are other animals within the poultry, like ducks and, and, and the thing, turkey, and others. I should be able to go to the market today to sit down on one chicken. I want to eat turkey. 
But where, where can I buy chicken? Is, you see, the local chicken is even more expensive than the so-called imported chicken they import into this country. That bad chicken that we eat in the... In fact, that is even now cheaper than our fish. Fish is so expensive now. Most families now go for that imported bad chicken because they cannot afford fish. And we have a lot of fish in our sea, but everything is going out. So look at the potentials in the marine sector, in the agro-industry, in the livestock industry, in the poultry industry. With all this value chain, to provide employment for our young people. Look at our sand resources. Even under the sun, look at our river Gambia. With all these resources, since independence, if you do stock taking, if you do an inventory of this country, what have you shown for it? Zero. And in fact, things are getting worse. And that is the most unfortunate part. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Citizens Alliance have a message. We've put out the message, and I think the message, uh, I hope the message has sent in. Um, uh, we've laid out a lot of things here, and what we don't want to do is talk about everything else but the issues. We know there are issues in this country, and uh, like Dr. said earlier on, we need to change from focusing on who is governing or who will govern uh, as, uh, onto how we govern and what should we used to govern, and that's what Citizens Alliance is going to do. Um, thank you, the media. Uh, we enjoy uh, the critical minds, the engaging minds, the questioning minds. That's the reason we call you here, and we hope we will have more engagements uh, in the future because that's what we want to do. Citizens Alliance is a transparent party. We want to put everything out there so that we can be accounted for, we can be scrutinized. We have a solution for this country and we want to share that and work with you. We don't want to work for you, we want to work with you through this journey. It's a crusade, it's a daunting task, but we're up for it and we'll work with you to get there. So um, I thank everybody present here. Uh, we appreciate you coming. Um, to the viewers, Citizens Alliance is not only a political party, but the political party, the solution for the Gambia. Citizens Alliance is the futuristic party. So vote Citizens Alliance come 2021, vote Dr. Ismaila Sisi come 2021. Until we come your way again, thank you very much. You guys have a blessed afternoon.